My name is Simon Patton. I'm the Managing Director of EMQN uh, and it's a warm welcome from uh, myself and all the faculty uh, and AstraZeneca, GenQA and EMQN to our uh, webinar on round six of um, the BRCA variant classification competence assessment EQA activity. Um, I'm just going to do a few uh, basic introduction slides and then I'm going to hand over to my colleague Professor Sandy Deans who's going to give the, the introduction to the webinar. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, just a few housekeeping issues for you. So your microphones will have automatically been muted. Um, please only mute, uh, unmute your microphone when you need to, uh, when you, if you want to say anything, but in most cases the probably the opportunity for doing that will be potentially at the end. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about the Q&A though in, in a minute. Uh, please note that the webinar has been recorded and it's our intention to make this available to you uh, and your colleagues uh, for later use, both for training and for a vision of uh, the activities that we've talked about. Um, we'll let you know, um, I think we're anticipating once it's been through compliance, it takes about two weeks for us to make it available to you, but we will let you know by email, by GenQA and EMQN uh, when that's available to you. Uh, and most importantly, this is an interactive session. So it is, you know, it's, it's, we're here to try and provide education, help you learn uh, associated with, it, with, with, this, with this webinar. Um, so your interaction with us is important. Um, so we have uh, made available to you a Q&A session. Uh, so at the bottom of your uh, Zoom window, you should see um, uh, an indicator saying Q&A. You can use that section to log your questions to us um, at any time you want during the during the webinar. Uh, we have about 10 minutes allocated at the end, depending on how long it takes to go through the variants, um, where we're going to, the, the expert speakers will be um, uh, answering some of your questions. But please be assured that even if we don't get around to answering all of your questions now, and we typically we don't get to, uh, then we will be uh, summarising our responses to you in our, in our report after the, the um, BRCA variant assessment has closed. Next slide, please. So finally, um, your feedback is important to us. Um, it helps us improve uh, and it helps us to provide better quality training to you as healthcare professionals. Um, so you should, after this uh, webinar has taken place, receive an email um, with a link to a short feedback survey. Um, we would be very grateful if you could spare a couple of minutes just to answer that feedback survey and give us your thoughts, see what we can do to improve, how we can help you in future. Okay, next slide, please. So I'm gonna hand over to my colleague, uh, Professor Sandy Deans, who's gonna give you the introduction now. Over to you, Sandy. Thank you, Simon. So I'd just like to add my welcome to you all. Um, um, and it gives me great pleasure in introducing our expert panel today. So the webinar is ensuring the correct classification of BRCA1 and BRCA2 variants. This is the first of a series of educational webinars, and we are planning to host a second set of webinars in the autumn that will cover other HRR gene variants. So we um, are very pleased to welcome Dr. Emma Howard to our expert panel. Um, Emma is the Operational Director in the Northwest Genomic Laboratory um, based in Manchester and Liverpool in the UK and also Miranda Durkee who is the Lead Clinical Scientist in the Northeast and Yorkshire Genomic Laboratory Hub based in Sheffield, Leeds and Newcastle GLH um, for in the UK as well. So next slide please. These are just the disclaimers and disclosures um, for you to review. So next slide, please. So the aims, as I say, um, for this series in the spring, we're going to provide two educational webinars and the focus is to promote accurate classification of BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene variants. This is going to follow um, the following format. We've got our um, masterclass expert panel um, webinar today, whereby we're going to have a, a presentation around the best practice guidelines that are currently available for us to use, and in particular those that are related to BRCA1 and BRCA2 gene variant classification. We're also going to present a summary of the resources that are available to us and work through some worked examples. So we have um, six variants, um, a mixture of BRCA1, BRCA2, varying different um, challenging um, variants to look at. We then will open um, from this afternoon online um, in 
access to the GenQ Genomics Training and Competency Assessment Tool, so GTACT. This is an online um, participation. Um, you can um, access it wherever you are. If you don't have um, already registered to access it, then please contact us and we can set that up for you. It's online, so participation is open to everyone and it's individual participation, so it's not laboratory based, so it can be used for your own um, CPD and CME going forward. So the ask is to classify six different BRCA gene variants and summarise the criteria that you have used for that classification. So it's all online, drop down menus, very easy to use, and then you can submit. What you can also do is download your own um, responses um, and your submissions. So when we meet again on the 30th of June for the second webinar, you can um, follow your own um, classifications and evidence used as the expert panel goes through the pro their processes and the evidence they use to classify the same six variants. And we'll also at that time be able to give you a summary of the EQA outcomes. So please note that this second webinar timing has changed. It has been delayed by a couple of weeks. So we're now going to um, hold that second one on the 30th of June, but you will be notified and your Outlook calendar invites will be updated following this webinar. We'll also very importantly have a question and answer session just like today um, to, to address some of the issues for those variants in the EQA run. So next slide please. So the objectives really from these combination of webinars is to provide an overview of the work framework to classify variants according to the current best practice guidelines that we have to work with. Also to outline the mechanism of classifying somatic variants according to these best practice guidelines. And as I said, to summarize the resources that are available that are specific to BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. We're also going to work um, through some examples of BRCA variants. And as I said, we will have a mixture of simple variant classification and complex classifications. Um, and we've got six examples to provide for you today. So next slide, please. So I'm now going to hand over to Dr. Emma Howard, um, who is going to start off with a, a summary of the current best practice guidelines that are available. Emma, over to you now, please. Thanks. Thank you, Sandy, for that introduction and welcome everybody today. So as Sandy said, um, myself um, and Miranda will, will just talk through um, a general introduction where we'll introduce BRCA and then the guidance associated with the interpretation of the variants within those genes. Can I have the next slide, please? So a very broad overview initially, you both all will know and very aware that BRCA1 and 2 are large tumour suppressor genes with a range of mutations that, that run throughout the genes, which include also exon deletions and duplications. And really nice schematics demonstrate not only the spread of mutations throughout these two genes, but also the protein um, domains, functional domains are also illustrated here too. Next slide, please. And just to run through some of the different um, variant mutation types in BRCA1 and 2, let's start first of all uh, with missense. We see these in, in, in the genes, but in specific functional domains too, primarily where the more pathogenic missense mutations are focused. And this is basically a substitution at the nucleotide level, which introduces a new amino acid. Frame shift mutations are also demonstrated throughout the genes, and this in, either an in, introduction or, or reduction of, of a nucleotide base, which, reduce, which results in a stop um, codon being introduced in the downstream. non symptom mutations are also seen, and this introduces a stop codon by a substitution of a base. And then we've also got large rearrangements that are seen in the form of duplications and deletions throughout the genes too. Next slide, three, please. So this, just, this slide just demonstrates the uh, classification system and it's based on the original IARC-5 classification system. It's really important when you do variant interpretation that you're um, able to establish a causal role of mutation and whether it's deleterious. And this is ranked from class five to class one. Class five being that pathogenic and this result confirms the diagnosis. Class, five, class four is likely pathogenic, which is consistent with the diagnosis. And for these two classes, you would then go on to test at-risk at relatives for, uh, for the variant and um, perform full high-risk surveillance for the patient. Class three is denoted as uncertain pathogenicity. And here you would not confirm or exclude a diagnosis. 
class two and class one. Class two is unlikely to be pathogenic, so likely benign, and class one is considered not pathogenic, so benign. And for those, for class three, you wouldn't expect to do predictive testing in at-risk relatives, but you may increase um, surveillance um, for the patient. But with class one and two, you would not do any extra surveillance for the patient or the relatives of that that patient. Uh, and based, although this is a classification system, what comes before the classification system is a whole raft of interpretation of the variant to get to that point. Next slide, please. So basically this slide just demonstrates the, the, the variants that we consider to be class five pathogenic. Next, next one, please, if we could just press, thank you. Um, so first, initially truncating mutations, but there are some exceptions to this particularly in um, BRCA1 nonsense or frame shift uh, mutations in the last 10 amino acids of the gene. And also likewise for BRCA2 in the last 110 amino acids. And this is because they're in the last exon, which may not, which does not go undergo nonsense mediated decay. Next one, please. Turning to splicing mutations, mostly plus one, minus one, plus two, minus two in the concatenal splice sites can mostly be assumed to be pathogenic. However, you shouldn't assume a splicing mutation is, and obviously plus three, minus three, or up to plus six, minus six. They may affect splicing, but they're far less predictable, and a full interpretation should be considered. And, and some exceptions are there for the, even the plus one, minus one, plus one, plus two, and these are demonstrated in the Enigma paper and should be consulted. And so you shouldn't basically assume anything, and interpretation of the, of the variant should also always be carried out. Next one. Thank you. So in terms of missense variants, these are usually can be pathogenic when they affect highly conserved residues in a functional domain. For example, in the BRCA1 ring finger domain or the BRAC domain or the BRCA2 DNA binding domain. But we shouldn't assume anything with a missense uh, variant and a full interpretation should be carried out. Next one, please. And lastly, large rearrangements and deletions. And most large deletions are pathogenic, but you should have, apply some caution when you're considering in-frame deletions. There is a BRCA1 exon 13 duplication, which is a very common founder pathogenic mutation in the UK. And other large duplications uh, not described in the literature should actually be proved to be in tandem before they can be um, considered as pathogenic. Okay, next slide, please. Just wanted to run over some of the terms that we see for class three unclassified variants. Um, and this is defined as a variation in a genetic sequence where whose association with disease risk is uncertain. And we see different terminology around class three in the cl unclassified variants being one, variant of uncertain significance, a variant of unknown significance. It's sometimes abbreviated as UV or a VUS. So just to be aware, these all refer to a class three variant. Next slide, please. And just an introduction in some of, um, basically a historic guide to some of the guidelines that have been in place over time. You started basically with the CMGS guidelines and I think, and quote me on this, I think it was 2008, these were initially um, released and they were um, updated um, and more, with a more focus on rare disease, I should say, with the ACMG um, release in 2015. The ACGS then, then took the ACMG and, and basically adapted them slightly and um, there was many iterations of this in 2017, then followed 2018 and finally we've got the latest draft which is on the ACGS website of the 2020 iteration of these guidance. Next slide please. This is my final slide before I hand over to Miranda, but also just to, to raise that there is another set of American molecular pathology guidance, which is focused more on the somatic setting. And although I wouldn't recommend using these solely for BRCA, but BRCA is seen in the somatic setting. Um, sometimes we use them in association with, with the um, 
the ACGS guidance as well. And basically, this is an evidence-based categorization for somatic variants, and they're classified into four different categories, dependent on their level of clinical significance uh, in cancer. And they're looked at for diagnosis, prognosis, and therapeutics. So variants in tier one have the strongest clinical significance, and variants in tier four are considered benign or likely benign. And they take into account things like an FDA-approved therapy, or you know, well-powered studies from clinical trials in order to denote which which tier the the, the variant um, sits within. So it's just to raise awareness that they are available for you and are particularly applicable um, for other cancers in the somatic setting um, at the you know, genomic tumor advisory boards. So I'm going to pass to my colleague Miranda, um, who will take you through the the next set of guidance slides. Thank you. Hello everybody, thank you very much Emma um, for that great introduction. So I'm going to continue with the variant interpretation and um, next up kind of on the list is the Enigma rules for classification. So I'm sure you're all very familiar with Enigma. They're um, a very important and well-established group, um, an international consortium that's been focused on variant interpretation within BRCA1 and BRCA2. And they've actually developed a multifactorial model. So this mathematical model um, puts in people of data from things like family history, pathology, co-occurrence and trans, in silico tools, etc., to have come up with a likelihood ratio and therefore a probability of pathogenicity for variants. Um, and this model has been then used to classify um, a large number of variants, so most recently seen in the Parsons et al. 2020 paper. So I've just highlighted here that those guidelines um, are specific for the more high penetrance variants rather than those with the, with the lower um, or intermediate or moderate level of risk. The other thing I want to say about Enigma is that they are the designated expert group um, by ClinGen for developing BRCA1 and BRCA2 variant classification guidelines. So um, they are working to adjust their framework to kind of fit with the ACMG criteria. Um, so this is still work in progress and we're not expecting any kind of guidelines in the imminent future, but um, hopefully soon. Uh, next slide, please. So on our historical journey through variant classification, um, the next um, up, the, obviously the very key seminal paper by Richards et al, 2015. And this is some joint guidelines from the ACMG and the AMP. And um, they came up with these 28 different criteria or codes covering a variety of different evidence. So this includes things like population studies, functional analysis, segregation data, um, is the variant um, seen de novo in cis, in trans, and also some of the computational predictions. So once you have your piece of evidence, you can try and fit it to one of the codes. So the only caveat is that sometimes it fits into more than one code. So you have to be quite cautious about not double counting the same piece of evidence twice. Uh, and then the table at the bottom shows, as well as having the different criteria and the different categories, is you've also got different strengths you can apply. So for the pathogenic categories, you can apply um, these at the strengths going from supporting, moderate, strong to very strong, and it's slightly different for the benign criteria. They can go supporting, strong, or standalone. Next slide, please. So this slide lays out all 28 of the different codes. Um, so you've got the uh, along the top and um, on the left, the benign criteria, on the right, the pathogenic criteria. And then they're also divided up into the different strengths that can, can be used. And um, along the left-hand side, the different um, criteria of, of evidence that can be used. So when you're gathering all your data for variant interpretation, you'll gather all your evidence and you'll fit the piece, different pieces of data to these different codes. Next slide, please. And then you'll kind of add those codes together and then your accumulated criteria, you would then compare to the classification table. So the one on the right is from the ACGS 2020 guidelines, which has been slightly updated um, since the original Richards et al paper. And um, there's also an equivalent one for the benign in Richards et al. Um, and if you have insufficient evidence to reach a conclusion um, or you've got conflicting evidence of pathogenicity, it may well be that your variant fits into the uncertain significance. 
So what are the issues for cancer susceptibility? Well, these guidelines were very much developed for rare disease with rare phenotypes. So there are quite a few categories that aren't really very applicable to us for things like we very rarely see de novo variants. And um, when we're doing segregation analysis, because it's a late onset um, disorder showing reduced penetrance and also has unfortunately has a high mortality, we very rarely get these large families available for segregation analysis. Next slide, please. So to try and address some of these issues, in 2017, the Cancer Variant Interpretation Group at UK, so CANVIG UK, um, was set up. And um, the aim was to develop some cancer susceptibility gene specific guidance. And this was published um, kind of last, um, last year. Um, and uh, it's, um, they're also being updated regularly. So we actually have some draft 2021 guidelines that are currently circulating for approval. Um, on the right hand side, just wanted to draw your attention to another CANVIG paper that actually shows how you can combine the evidence for and against pathogenicity and also what criteria you can and can't use together to avoid that double counting. Next slide, please. So I wanted to highlight this as a, a fantastic example of how the CAMVIG um, guidance and the group has um, really helped um, the class reclassification of lots of VUSs. So from Richards et al, PS4 um, is defined as the prevalence of a variant in affected individuals is significantly increased compared to the prevalence in controls. But in order to kind of to actually calculate that, you need the case control studies. And we're very lucky in the UK, there's been a big project to get all the genomics labs to submit all their data to Public Health England, who then match it up with the cancer registry. And then that aggregated data is then released back to, to CAMVIG and is put on the CAMVIG UK website and we can then use that data to look up the number of UK cases with a variant or where it's wild type and we can compare those to ethnically matched controls from NOMAD um, and using this very simple fit is exact test it will give us a p-value that means we can use PS4 all the way up to very strong and this has enabled us to reclassify numerous variants that were stuck at VUS level um, using this case control um, evidence. Next slide, please. Um, so there are lots of other uh, areas that we've kind of, um, yeah, made the guidelines a bit more um, cancer susceptibility gene specific. So um, they are shaded gray in the appendix of that publication. So just to highlight another one quickly, um, is PM1 in Richards et al. It says it's, um, you could apply PM1 for a well-established functional do domain without benign variation. So obviously in BRCA1, we've got the BRCT and the ring domains and BRCA2, we've got the DNA binding domains. But all those domains still do show some um, benign variation. So therefore, in um, this version of the guidelines, we've specified that you can use PM1 supporting for some key residues that have been listed by Enigma with it, and it's got the link at the bottom of the page. Next slide, please. And just finally, I wanted to show you some of the things that are coming up in the new 2021 guidelines. So as I mentioned, Enigma have this multifactorial model and um, we've actually developed a method um, in order to convert the, the likelihood ratio or the log likelihood ratio from the Enigma multifactorial model into the evidence points and then into the evidence strengths that we can use that um, uh, evidence you know, it's still in the ACMG framework while we're waiting for those guidelines to come up out from Enigma. Another amazing resource is uh, we've put together um, an XLS of all the different functional studies that have been done um, and the uh, CAMVIG steering group have have assessed all of those according to the functional guidelines, so Brunich et al, and it gives a good summary of them and also importantly tells you what strength you can apply PS3 and BS3. So um, the link to the Kanji and Canvar website is there if you want to have a look um, at those ratified guidelines. Next slide please. Um, and now I'm going to hand back to my colleague Emma and we're going to go through some variant classification examples from Run4. Thank you. Thanks for that, Miranda, for that excellent summary. I'm bringing us right up to date to where we are with the, the new guidance as well. Thank you. So turning our attention to the variant classification, um, we've got six variants to go through. Uh, the first uh, are quite simple classifications, and then we'll move to the more complex ones. So can I have the next slide, please? So variant classification one, for variant one. Here, next slide, please. 
Okay, so first of all, this is a BRCA2 variant. It's a synonymous variant. It's at a nucleotide 750 with a G to A substitution, resulting in a violin, uh, at, uh, amino acid 250 to, to violin because it's a synonymous missense variant. Like I say, it was in BRCA2 and it's not in a functional domain. Next slide, please. So BRCA2, these are the, the for this particular variant, these are uh, the data bases or the resources that we've interrogated. So we take them in turn in the table. We've got BRCA share. It is on BRCA share, but it's as a note as being unclassified um, variant, but a class three with a note saying it has been scored differently by different curators. It is on NOMAD at 0.0078% which is low. We've also it's seen on BRCA exchange and is denoted as likely benign. It's not on HGMD. It is on Climbar and it has a three star rating um, and, and because it has been reviewed by an expert group, which was the Sharing Clinical Reports Project. Uh, the REVEL score in this um, is, is not applicable. And um, other information such as spicing algorithms, which are within Alamut, um, it has been reviewed and there was no predicted impact on splicing. Next slide, please. So this is also because it's a synonymous variant, it's important to scrutinize the nucleotide conservation at that base. So this is base um, nucleotide 750, you can see here with the ringed area, that it's a very low conservation at this nucleotide. Next slide, please. And so therefore, to summarize, there was no evidence favoring that this was a pathogenic variant. There was two pieces of evidence that suggested this was a benign variant. So we used BP4 supporting because the splicing prediction programs showed no impact. And we also used BP7 supporting because like I've just illustrated in the slide previously, this is a synonymous or a silent variant at a weakly conserved nucleotide. There was um, a paper by Jahel et al in 2017, which indicated a splicing transactivation study uh, with this variant, and it suggested it was likely benign, but there was no other data except some narrative. So um, we weren't able to um, apply a functional, a benign functional piece of um, um, evidence here. So we did not use BS3. So in, um, overall, the summary for this is BP4 supporting, BP7 supporting, which gives you prediction of class two, likely benign. Next slide, please. So this is the classification of variant two. Next slide, please. This is also a BRCA2 variant, which is um, a nucleotide 1013 as a deletion. And um, it also results in a frame shift uh, variant. Um, and it is not in a functional domain. Next slide, please. So again, the resources that we interrogated in order to interpret this variant were BRCA share, which it wasn't present. It wasn't. It was not present on Nomad, or BRCA exchange, or HDMD, or Climvar. Um, there was no effect on splicing with the prediction tools in Alamut, and the REVEL score is not applicable in this situation. Next slide, please. So this is just to demonstrate that actually um, this is a loss function uh, variant. So um, a piece of evidence that we can use and it's not on NOMAD. So that would give us a very strong uh, piece of evidence, PVS1 and the moderate because we would use PM2 because it's not on NOMAD. But as Miranda um, said in the introduction slides and was able to illustrate that there's been an updated table from what was originally released in the ACMG guidance in 2000, so in the Rich Detail paper in 2015. And this gives you, if you use, if you use the old table, which is on the right-hand side of your slide, you'll see that a very strong, uh, so one very strong and a one moderate piece of evidence actually makes it likely pathogenic. But turning to the table on your left-hand side, you'll see that this is the modified version, which is based on new Bayesian uh, modeling from um, Sean Tatajivia in 2018, and actually a very strong piece of evidence and a moderate in this circumstance, in this new table, would give you a pathogenic variant. So it's just important, and I wanted to demonstrate the use of most up-to-date table it, it is, is, recommend, is highly recommended because it actually um, gives you a, a, a more uh, clarity on your, on your classification around some, some of these changes that have been made. Can I have the next slide, please? And therefore, just to summarize what I've just said in the previous slide, we had a PVS1 very strong, 
which is because we've got a null variant in a gene where loss of function is a known mechanism of disease. And we had PM2 and the moderate because it was completely absent from controls in our nomad. There was no um, benign variant, evidence for benign variant. And so overall, we had a PVS1 very strong, PM2 moderate, which prediction is class five, which is pathogenic. Next slide, please. So my final classification is for variant three. So next slide, please. And this is another BRCA2 variant, which is uh, at nucleotide 3620, giving a substitution of an A to a G, and tire 1207 cis at the protein level. This is a missense, non-synonymous variant, and it is not in a functional domain. Next slide, please. Again, the resources that we looked at were BRCA share, which it was not present. Nomad, it was present, but it was at 0.0004%. Uh, it was on BRCA exchange, but it's not yet being reviewed. It's not on HDMD. It is on ClinVar as an unclassified variant. The REVEL score, which is applicable in because it's a missense variant, is 0.282. And the other missense prediction tools, which are embedded in Alamut, so, such as SIF, Polyphen, Align, GVGD, and Mutation Taster, all predicted that this was a benign variant. And just to note, the REVEL score, which has had, um, um, I've raised its profile more recently as, as the more preferable option um, around um, missense prediction tools, because it looks at um, more tools basically to come up with a, a point score. And this can be assessed and you can get this through Varsome and I've put the link there. Okay, next slide, please. So there was no uh, evidence favoring pathogenicity for this variant. And the evidence favoring a benign variant was uh, a BP4. So a supporting piece of evidence at multiple lines of computation computational evidence support a non-deleterious effect. And this was also supported by the REVEL score because under 0.4, you can apply this benign piece of evidence here and our REVEL score was, was below that. Um, and we also, other evidence, the only other piece of evidence was this paper where it suggested that in BRCA2 domain, um, this is a cold spot for missense pathogenic mutations but not, it doesn't reach the BP1 criterion in the ACMG uh, guidance. And what they said was that of the 34 pathogenic or likely pathogenic missense variants in BRCA2, none are in exons 10 and 11, and this variant does sit in 11, but it doesn't give us enough um, evidence to apply this piece of evidence here. So basically we, we've only got one benign piece of supporting evidence. So the overall classification for this is a, a class three unclassified variant. And I'm going to hand over to Miranda now to, to continue uh, with variants four to six. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emma. Just before we get started, just a reminder for participants, that if you want to submit a question for us, just please put it in the Q&A. Thanks. Um, and also, I was going to say that um, you can also get the REVEL scores on the uh, Canva UK website if uh, that helps too. Okay, um, so now I'll carry on. Uh, so variant four, um, next slide, please. So this is a BRCA1 missense variant, C.16488C, um, and it is a missense variant that's not sitting within one of the key BRCA1 um, functional domains. Next slide, please. So a summary of all the databases and resources that we've looked at. So this variant's actually been fairly well reported. It is on BRCA share as a neutral variant. It has been reviewed on BRCA exchange and, and classified as benign. HDMD had some conflicting um, uh, data um, and it was on ClinVar as being benign and the REVEL score is low, below 0.14. But I wanted, what I wanted to highlight was this NOMAD um, data. Um, next slide, please. So when you're um, looking to see if you can apply um, BS1 um, for um, your kind of um, case control data, the best population to select is to go on NOMAD version 2.1.1 and select the non-cancer controls. And then for BRCA1 and BRCA2, you're best off comparing to the non-cancer females. So I've highlighted um, here in the box that when you kind of see a result like this, we've got an allele frequency of around about 0.0. 
0.01% and about 19, 19 alleles, you may kind of be umming and ahhing about whether you should apply BS1 or not. Um, and there's been a fantastic tool developed by Nikki Whiffin and James Ware's group called the CardioDB Allial Frequency app. And on that app, you can plug in your disease prevalence, your disease penetrance, genetic heterogeneity and allelic heterogeneity. And that gives you your maximum tolerated allele frequency that you can use for BS1. But the good news is, is that you don't need to do all of that because we've already done that for you. So if you look on the Kanjin Canva resources um, link that's on the slide, um, um, then um, the presentation's present there. And we've calculated BS1 and BA1 um, frequencies for BRCA1, BRCA2, PALB2, and all the Lynch genes. Next slide, please. So to summarise the data for this um, variant, um, there was no, no evidence for favouring it being a pathogenic variant. So then the evidence favoured being a benign variant, uh, I've kind of given the game away, but actually when you go through and have a look at the, the presentation and apply um, that level of BS1, this variant does meet BS1. Um, interestingly, for this um, variant in run four, more participants use PM2 than use BS1. Um, so yeah, <laughs> uh, this hopefully will help you. Um, in addition, there's um, a BP4 uh, applied because it was identified in trans with a known BRCA1 pathogenic variant. Um, and there are functional studies showing no effect on homologous recombination. And um, we've also got the REVEL score um, showing so we can apply BP4 as well. So in summary, this is, um, if you are applying the BS1 as well, you can, you can get this variant to a class one benign variant. Next slide, please. So variant five, next slide, please. So this is a, um, another missense variant, BRCA2 this time. So this is a C.7978 T to G. And uh, this time, this variant is present in the DNA binding domain. Next slide, please. And when you look at the different databases and resources, it was um, not present on BRCA share. It was um, not reviewed on BRCA exchange. HGMD um, was listed as a question mark and disease causing mutation. ClinVar listed it as a likely pathogenic, pathogenic variant. It has got a very high REVEL score um, and it was not present in NOMAD. Next slide, please. So this one should be fairly straight, um, straightforward, um, but actually only about half of the participants used PS3, um, and which was quite critical to being able to kind of um, uh, classify this variant. And so we've got three different functional assays there that, that showed an abnormal function. Using the Brinich et al guidelines, the Goodigley 2018 paper meets PS3 strong and the Mesmer paper meets um, PS3 moderate. So you can apply PS3 strong um, for those assays. Um, and then even less participants use this PP1, which is the segregation analysis. But this was what was really key to kind of help boost up that um, um, pathogenicity score. Um, so there are two key papers that actually showed segregation of over 10 meioses from eight different families. And that was calculated using Jarvik and Browning, just calculating the segregation in the affected um, individuals. So in addition, um, we used PS4 moderate because the variant was observed in multiple unrelated affected individuals from um, publications and um, various databases. It was absent from nomads, we applied PM2 moderate and the REVEL score um, allowed us to apply PP3 supporting. So in summary, we classified this variant as class five pathogenic. Next slide, please. Variant six, next slide, please. This one's a slightly more tricky one. Um, so it was a BRCA2 del ints, um, and um, this causes a frame shift to the protein. And generally with a frame shift, you just assume the, the prior risk of pathogenicity to be very high. Next slide, please. However, when you start looking at the databases and resources, there's some conflicting information. So it's on BRCA share as benign. It's not been reviewed on BRCA exchange. It is reported on HDMD as a disease causing mutation. And on ClinVar, it's conflicting. Um, obviously, we can't use the REVEL score um, for this type of variant. And um, then it was really the NOMAD data that um, kind of caused problems. So um, next slide, please. 
So if you're going through a tool such as Alamut and you're looking at the Dell Ints, it will show you that that variant isn't present on Nomad. But I would always recommend going and looking at Nomad um, yourself because actually in this case it's listing two you know right at the same position two separate insertion events and you can see they've been seen at a frequency of 69 and 73 alleles and if you just scroll down the page on nomad you get this um, window showing the different bam files and you can load as many of these bam files as you want and you can kind of see the purple lines that shows you those insertions so you can see clearly see from the bam file that those two separate insertion events as they're listing them are actually in cis and then we work out the hdvs it is our variant of, of interest next slide please So a summary of the evidence. Um, so the evidence favour it being a pathogenic variant. It was reported as pathogenic in pancreatic cancer by this publication. Unfortunately, if you go and read the publication, there's no evidence supporting that why they've called it pathogenic. I think they just saw a frame shift and didn't realise that the frame shift variants or truncating variants near the three prime end of the BRCA2 um, gene aren't necessarily pathogenic. So um, as I've demonstrated that we can use BS1 because the allele frequency is actually greater than 0.02. Actually, um, in this case, about double the number of participants use PM2 compared to, um, to BS, BS1. So it's a, a, yeah, it was a tricky one, but um, one to watch out for. And then we also used um, BP2, which is the co-occurrence um, with another class 5 variant in trans. And then the other evidence that is absolutely critical for this variant that's actually really hard to apply using the ACMG criteria is that we know that BRCA2 truncating variants downstream of the residue P3309 are not clinically important. So that's been demonstrated by the functional assays and obviously we've got the common LICE 3326 um, variant. Next slide, please. I think that's, um, yeah, I'm going to hand back over to Sandy now. Thanks, Miranda. And thank you also, Emma, for running through the variants. That's fantastic. And a lot of um, background information there, which is great to be able to help guide through um, variant classification. So next slide, please. Lovely. So this is just a summary of our next steps. So please, um, if you wish to participate in the next BRCA variant run, um, the, the website here is where you can register. Uh, once you've registered, you'll get, um, is confirmed, you'll receive instructions how to log into the system. Um, as I mentioned, um, it is going to start from this afternoon. We're good to go live. So that's actually available from um, the end of the webinar and we'll run to the end of May. You can log in um, and complete your classification and submit the details of the criteria applied online. And then you can download the report of your own submissions. Then you will be invited to join the webinar on the 30th of June um, and join us with our expert panel again to review the variants on this EQA run um, and then have a, a question and answer session whereby we can actually um, um, discuss some of the variants if you wish to um, raise some issues. Um, so you just log need to then log on to your account and you can download your assessed report and participation certificate after the 30th of June event. So um, next slide, please. A very big thank you for our um, expert panel. Um, and now we're going to pass over back to Simon um, and run our question and answer session. So once again, we've got some questions in, in the um, Q&A box, but please do um, submit your questions and we'll try and work through them. If we can't get an answer today, we'll definitely um, include them into the EQA run summary report. So everything will be shared with everyone um, at a future date. So Simon, can I come back to you now, please? Thank you very much indeed, Sandy. So uh, welcome back. Um, so it's over to me to, uh, to try not to put my speak, my colleagues and fellow presenters on the hot spot, but um, it's really, this is your session to um, get as much out of this webinar as possible. Uh, and uh, as we said before, please do use the question and answer facility for asking your questions. Um, we've got a number coming in. So I'm gonna start off with a couple of questions really um, for our speakers. So the first question is from Miranda. So ClinGen have recently published a recommendation that PM2, or absence or rarity in controls, be downgraded from moderate to supporting. How will that affect variant classifications in BRCA1 or BRCA2, and how will the change be implemented? 
Thank you, Simon. Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so uh, the first part is how is it going to affect uh, the variant classifications? Well, obviously, there's a there's a significant worry that particularly the rare missense variants that are sitting around that likely pathogenic and BUS border border will end up being down classified without any real change in their evidence. So when the ClinGen recommendation was published, they did say that they anticipate that there will be an adjustment of some of the other criteria in order to accommodate for this downweighting of PM2. So we know that the ACMG guidelines are going through a major rehaul. Um, so they're changing the guidelines to be more um, into the likelihood um, uh, uh, likelihood ratio kind of model of scoring um, system um, and we're expecting those guidelines to come out um, probably the early part of next year. So within the UK, both within the rare disease and the cancer variant interpretation groups, we felt that we would not want to uh, implement that downgrading of PM2 until we've got those new guidelines, because we were particularly worried about two families with exactly the same variant being managed clinically different, just depending when their variant classification took place, even though they're exactly the same evidence. Um, what I would say is for all you participants um, is that we you won't be penalised if you use PM2 at supporting or moderate. I think there's hopefully now the facility on GTAC that you can actually specify which um, variant interpretation guidelines you're using. So that would be really helpful um, to do that. But just use PM2 as you would do according to your own local local guidelines. Thanks for that, Miranda. I mean, that was one of the questions that came up from our colleagues uh, outside of this meeting was, you know, what happens if I use other guidance as well? Um, and you've quite clearly stated that we will take that into account in our assessment process and we will, we will, we will uh, feed back to the, to the uh, participants as we do so. Um, Emma, I have a question for you. Uh, so can we use PS3 and PP3 together? So um, yes, we can but only in certain scenarios. So, so um, if you've got a missense sense and you've got functional um, work, but you've also got um, prediction tools, missense sense prediction tools, you can use them in that setting, but you can't use them when you've got mRNA studies um, because if you've got mRNA for splicing, for instance, then you can't use PP3 as well. You should use PS3 in that sense when you've got mRNA. And this is because the prediction um, is the same. So, so basically they're saying that you're using the same piece of evidence twice, but you can use it when you've got a missense with functional and using the missense prediction tool. So in that scenario, yes, but not with mRNA. Okay, great. Thank you, Emma, very much indeed. Um, we have a question from Bethan. Um, which I think uh, Miranda is going to answer, which is there hasn't been a mention of the use of BP6 or PP5 in those classifications. Are these applicable, uh, sorry, are these acceptable to apply? Yeah, thank you. So just to clarify, this is the reputable source criteria that was originally in the ACMG um, guidelines by Richards et al. And then they've kind of removed it because they've said that you should really contact the, the lab um, to try and get that evidence um, available. In the A in the CAMBI guidelines, we have um, allowed the use of that so that we could um, Basically, if the, if the variants on clin, um, ClinVar, I think you should contact the laboratory and try and get that evidence and use their evidence to fit into the ACMG codes. But what we've really struggled with is some of the evidence, particularly from Enigma's multifactorial model and how we incorporate that into the ACMG guidelines. So we have allowed you to use PP5 and BP6 for um, Enigma or in some cases Insight, although the Insight data is a bit easier to kind of... Um, match to the ACMG criteria. Um, but as I showed, hopefully in the new 2021 guidelines, we now have a framework for actually applying that um, Enigma multifactorial evidence into the um, different points and then into, into the strengths. So I, I, I think I agree, kind of use it in exceptional circumstances, but, but yeah, sometimes you need to. Thank you, Miranda. Um, I'm going to stay with you because we've got a question here for one of your variants, so variant six, um, and the use of BP2. So is it only valid to use if in trans proven and FA symptoms absent? Yes. 
I should have made that I should have made it clear yeah that paper did specify that it was confirmed in trans and the patient had no um, uh, clinical features of Fanconi's anemia yes thank you okay thank you for that and then we've also got one here for so for frame shift variants that are present at very low frequency one female observation in a non-cancer cohort in nomad we would have to use pm2 supplementary and pvs1 which is not enough to give a class five um this is variant two emma so i'm going to come to you um so these um variants are clearly pathogenic and most of them have also been classified by enigma we've been using ps4 based on internal data to bump the variant up to a five, as there's no other criteria that we could use. Mm -hmm. Could you please provide us with some advice? Yeah, so going back to firstly what Miranda was saying about PM2 supporting, we haven't actually ratified that in, in the UK at the moment, so we probably use you know, we may not use it in the supporting, but I don't, it, it, if you did use it in the supporting, like you say, I, take, I totally take your point that, you know, these are class five and you know it's a class five and I, I, there's no issue at all as long as you, you're using PS4, um, you know, as long as you've got the data to support the use of PS4 in order to bump it up. So, you know, to PS4 you can use when you've got two unrelated um, patients with, with the phenotype, uh, as long as you're not double counting those patients and you absolutely know that they're unrelated. There is no issue in my mind that you, you can't use PS4 in that, in that scenario in order to get to that class five, yeah. But I, yeah, this is this is partly I'm going to come to Miranda, but this is partly, you know, one of these debates that we've had about the PM2 supporting and how it can sort of affect the, the, the classification. And this is a frame shift. And as long as it's not in the last exon, and we'll, we'll just, you know, caution's got to be applied there, then then, yeah, in most part, there would be a class five. Yeah. Great. Over Thanks, to Miranda. I know yeah, you does want Miranda to want to come in? Yeah, have a little <laughs> conversation. Sorry, only just to say that, um, yeah, we use PS4 quite a lot. And again, on, um, from the UK count. So um, again, it's in a slightly different place, but we've got all those counts from um, Public Health England. Um, and there's, you know, you can often see it's in ton of 20 pro bands and it's not, it's once in Nomad and you can use that very simple fit is exact test to get a PS4 strong or very strong, which means that you've got no doubt that that variant is class five. Great, thank you, Miranda. Um, and Emma. So Simon, back to you, have you some more questions? Yeah, thank you very much indeed, Sandy. So we've got a general question here, which I think we covered at the start, but um, really a question from a, from a participant saying, will this seminar be, be recorded? Uh, and thank you for an interesting seminar. Um, yes, uh, the answer to that question is it will be recorded. And um, as we said before, we will make it available, a link available to all the participants sometime in the next couple of weeks. We, we anticipate it might take up to two weeks because obviously the videos have to go through compliance, but generally, yes, the intention is to make it fully available to all our participants uh, so you can review it at any stage. Um, a question for both Emma and, um, and Miranda. Um, so this question is, is there any database we, or, or could we evaluate variant position on which we could use to evaluate variant position in BRCA1 and BRCA2? A general question. Is there a database we could use to evaluate variant positions in BRCA1 and BRCA2? So on the Canva UK um, website, um, at the mo it's in, in the process of being updated, but at the moment it's only got the um, SMVs rather than any frame shift variants. But yeah, the, that, that's kind of a very good resource pulling in all the data from Nomad um, or BIC, LAVD, ClinVar, et cetera. It shows you the in silico tools, the functional analyses, but you can also, there's um, also a function that you can record your own classifications. So if other people have seen that variant um, and have can either upload notes or just kind of, you can just type in and, and, and give it a variant classification. Um, I think we're underusing that facility at the moment, but the aim is to get more and more people using it. So we kind of share the expertise and the knowledge that we've got within um, the, um, you know, diagnostic lab so that everyone's not having to repeat the same, you know, the same work. So that I would say that's a good um, starting point for you. Yeah, I'd agree with that, Miranda. And also just to emphasize the use of elements, also a great um, tool where, where you've got a lot of resources all pulled in into one interface. Clinvar, for instance, Nomad is all in there. That's a, a good, um, a good tool to use as well. I think it's clear though, isn't it? It's, it's, it's why, you know, to, to use a very used phrase is why reinvent the wheel? I mean, the opportunity is there for sharing our experience 
uh, and tools do exist to do that. And I think as mm -hmm. a community, it's really it's a value to do to actually use those facilities and share your expertise and experience with your colleagues. Yeah. Great. I have another general question. So if I come to you, Emma, first and then Miranda. Mm -hmm. So what type of functional analysis could be considered a strong evidence? So what about IHC, saturation genome editing yeah. and other in vivo in vitro experiments? What's your thoughts? Yeah, so the, again, um, going back to what Miranda said about the CanVig, they've actually called out um, some of the, the ones that have got more strength than others. I think um, genome editing was in there. Miranda, you might have to help me out with some of the others. But there was, the, was the cell transfection one not, <coughs> not recommended as strongly? There was some that have been called out. So I would refer you to those guidance, actually, because it does list them. Um, what they would consider to be stronger and actually gives them more like a points um, system on IHC and, 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 and things like that. So the you know, genome editing one is definitely more, more strongly. Um, gets and I more. guess it's not just the methodology either. It's about going back and looking at the publication yeah. to understand what actually was done. That's right. And yeah. so that, thank you for that prompt, because they also, you know, it's making sure that those functional assays have enough pathogenic variants included and that at least this one that's been assessed is at least equivalent or surpasses the other pathogenic variants within that functional assay. And also that there's a number of controls that are put through that are clearly, you know, you can see that the function of the protein is, is maintained with those, those controls in place. So there's a number of different variables that you need to consider when you, um, you're interpreting a functional assay. It's not just the methodology. It's the number of controls, the number of pathogenic variants that have been put through as well. And there's some really good papers out there that, um, you know, the, 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 the Findlay paper, for instance, the Bowman paper, which are really sound science behind them, which, you know, would definitely, you know, you, you'd have far more credibility if a variant was pathogenic and being called out in one of those as well. And they are also listed within the guidance too. Yeah, thanks, Emma. Miranda, did you want to come in there? Anything else that we should be thinking about? Um, yes, yeah, so I agree with Emma in terms of functional assays. And then um, we don't get it so often for the BRCA genes, um, maybe um, LOH, um, but mm. within the CANVIG guidelines, particularly it's very useful for the Lynch um, um, genes is that we can use MSI testing and the IHC and loss of heterozygosity to help count towards PP4. So the phenotype specificity, it's not specific to that variant, but it's pointing to that gene. Um, and so if there's yeah, other things like that, then that, that can help you um, apply pp4 great thanks Miranda Simon back to you thank you Sandy so I've got one for um, either well either you or or Emma or Miranda um, so is there a number or value that has a threshold to determine if something has high or low conservation um. I'm, I'm not sure, I, to, at the top of my head, I, I can't remember the, the threshold value. I can come back to you about that, but I do know that the conservation scores are, are, are formed from like looking at fast cons and phylop scores as well. And, and basically these are the scores that they look at different orthologs in order to, you know, to, to produce this score. And I, I can't remember at the top of my head, Miranda may be able to, we can come back to that, what the threshold is, but it is on. So Alama, how it demonstrates it, it is using those scores from those systems. So are we talking nucleotide conservation? Yeah. And, uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, I use the visual graph in, in <laughs> yeah. I'll be honest I do but beyond that visual graph is these scores as well and I can't remember it isn't conserved um, yeah. <laughs> it's not resigned yeah I mean, I like for, for the for participants obviously I mean these a lot of these questions are coming off the, off yeah directly to our, our, our panel we haven't seen them before but what we will do is if we can't answer them now we will make sure that we get a, an answer back to you after the after the assessment in in, in the report uh, another question for both of you. Um, it was, I think this relates to variant six, so probably you, Miranda, but if it was interesting to note that we can use BP4 and BP7 together, are there any cautions one should use uh, when giving two bits of evidence? Which that in the participant station, I don't usually give them both together. So that's BP4 and BP7 related to variant six, I think it is. Uh, that, was, that was actually one of Emma's. Emma's it was. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for that. No, and I take the point, actually. I don't know what you think about that, Miranda, actually, because I don't think, I mean, we've done, we've used this in run four. We've never considered that it was double counted, but it could possibly be. Um, so <laughs> right, it doesn't say in the guidance not to use them together, I don't believe, but. No, it, uh, and then it, if you look at the uh, second CAMIC publication about the combining evidence, we mm -hmm. have allowed it for that. I think it's used, I think, 
BP4 is strictly a synonymous variant. Mm -hmm. Perhaps they were quite often. So, so no, BP7. That's, BP7. Yeah. Mm. BP7. BP7, sorry, is for a synonymous variant. So if you've got no effect on splicing, you've got no known mechanism for, for disease. Um, and so it's, uh, yeah, it's just, I think, quite commonly used for, for um, those variants. I think a good example of how things are not always clear cut either and what no. to use when exactly yeah, exactly so simon i've got one final question from my side until we go back to you so um both miranda and emma how do you determine easily if the mutation is in an important functional domain so, so i suppose yeah it, i suppose literature is a good one and the enigma paper because yeah. that basically calls out critical regions um, I'd use those as a starting point. Miranda, do you have anything else that you, you use? I like the Decipher website. Oh, okay, yeah. It's, it's got a good kind of graphical view mm -hmm. of the gene and shows the yeah. functional domains, where all the ClinVar variants are. And then it's got this amazing new tab that shows you where the areas that are not subject to nonsense mediated decay and mm. now as well, which is, which is really helpful. Great, that's great advice. Right. Thank you both. And then Simon, back Thank to you. you. So uh, one last question for me as well. So, uh, and again, it's a general one, is how do I apply somatic guidelines to germline var variants? <laughs> Just to finish off on a nice one. Well, That's a challenging one there, Simon. It is, <laughs> it is a challenge. I, I think I said in the introduction, we, we sometimes, we, we wouldn't use them in preference to the germline guidance in BRAC, with using BRCA. Mm. So with the somatic ones, we tend to use those um, in, in a very much a somatic setting, for instance, like looking at RAS genes or, or that around a tumour mutation uh, board where you'd, you'd be looking just at somatic variants. And yeah, I suppose you can use them in terms of therapy for BRCA just by categorising, using those categories that are, that are denoted the one to four, um, because this is, a you know, mostly... PARP is licensed and, um, you know, you could use tier one for that, but they're, they're almost in support of, of the germline, but not, not in addition, in addition, not instead of, I should say. And for BRCA, you know, it was important to raise that they're available, but I wouldn't advocate using them instead of the germline guidance. So, yeah, you could just still categorise them within the tier. The, um, I don't see any harm in that. And I think I think they recommend in the AMP that, that most of the germlines are considered within tier one. But you'd have to do, you have still have to understand that if that, if that it, variant is pathogenic in order to put it in tier yeah. one. Yeah. So you still need to do that full interpretation and then categorize it as we, as per the AMP. That's how we do it. OK, Brad, do you have anything to add to that at all? Yeah, no, I just fully agree. And I think <laughs> Even if you're doing somatic testing um, on a, you know, an ovarian or a bre breast cancer sample, you, and you identify a BRCA1 and BRCA2 variant, it's got a quite a high likelihood of being present in the germline, and therefore I think it's really important for the other family members, etc., is that those um, that variant is classified using the ACMG, AMP, mm -hmm. you know, AMP guidelines, Canvig, you know, whatever germline guidelines, as well as the somatic ones. Fantastic. Thank you very much.